that's nice. That's nice. If I fall asleep and snore, don't record the snoring. Okay. <laughs> I'll just record the falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had anybody fall asleep during this? No. Oh, I'll be the first. I'm, I'm open to it. <laughs> Sex positive culture. It's my body to give. Are threesome gifts a thing? Taking a bra off. I like your bed. Horizontal. 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 This is Horizontal with Lila. First, I have to say <laughs> that I am Lila and I am Horizontal in San Francisco, California. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I am sexual folklorist Dixie Della Tour and I am Horizontal with Lila. Yes! Oh, it sounds so good! <laughs> yes! Horizontal is the podcast of intimacies recorded while lying down. In this episode, I lie down with sexual folklorist Dixie De La Tour. Dixie is the founder, curator, and host of Body Storytelling, the longest-running sex storytelling series in the United States. Sammy Amounts of the Make America Relate Again podcast was the first to mention body to me in the late summer of last year, and she insisted that I simply must attend the Risk and Body collaboration show at the Bell House last September. I did. I saw. I played bango. I started courting Dixie immediately. She is a mesmerizing storyteller. Her southern lilt, her flagrant nonchalance and nonchalant brazenness, her heart of gold, her heaving bosom. She's not just a connector in the Malcolm Gladwell sense of the word. She's a super connector, a mega connector. Her shows get people laid. It's happened so often that there's even a song for that. Her shows spark romance, start relationships, and I believe may have even been tangentially responsible for a body baby or two. I was tickled and honored and seam-bursting with joy when I finally had the chance to get horizontal with Dixie in her chosen hometown of San Francisco, California. We recorded in the guest room of a 24-ish member intentional community in Soma. One of my classmates from NYU lives there. It's like the Parthenon of intentional communities. For tales from the road, like the one about how I got totally infatuated with a guy there and wound up acting like a 13-year-old girl. For pretty pictures of my adventures and horizontality in unexpected places. For invites to live shows and my writings about intimacy of all kinds. Sign up on horizontalwithlila.com. While I was driving cross-country solo on my Horizontal Does America road trip, I didn't listen to music. I just didn't have the impulse to. I listened to books. I listened to podcasts. I talked to my friends on the phone. I talked to myself. I sang to myself. Or I drove along in meditative-type quiet. I listened to episode after episode of Dixie's Body Storytelling podcast. After a while, Dixie started to feel like a road spirit, an auditory escort, my most frequent aural, A-U-R-A-L, companion. Behind the wheel of my borrowed Honda Civic, while listening to Body, I repeatedly squealed, laughed, teared up, and said, Oh. My. All the way across America. We are so fortunate that Dixie has centered her life around living stories, telling them, and getting other people to tell them well. What is it they say about living legends? She's a national treasure. Explore her body of work, pun intended, on bodystorytelling.com. That's B A W D Y storytelling.com. If you enjoy our horizontal storytelling, and I am quite certain that you will, become a patron of the horizontal arts. You can be a patron for $2 a month on up, darling, and the rewards get more delectable as you increase. For instance, for $10 a month, you'll get access to the love poem of the month a private recording of one of my favorites. For $15 a month, you'll get a ticket to a live show or access to a secret episode, and so on. Patronage is what makes it possible for me to continue making independent, uncensored, ad-free, homemade radio. I believe that when we make private conversations public, 
intimacy becomes contagious. And the more intimacy we cultivate, the happier our lives. Be a part of it through patreon.com slash horizontal with Lila. Patreon is spelled p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash horizontal with Lila. Your patronage helps make the world more intimate. In this first part of our conversation, we talk about body, bango, Craigslist personal ads, the unknown hookup, and being a porn magnet. And Dixie also tells me a tale about a porno booth with glory holes everywhere. Stick around at the end of the episode. I'm doing something I've never done before. Stick around for a little treat. A body song by Jefferson Berge, as heard at the Body Storytelling Show. And now, come lie down with us in San Francisco, California. So tell me about your cross-country podcasting adventure, Lila. Okay, okay. I feel like I've been courting you, and and then we're finally you have lying been down courting together. me for a while. <laughs> I know. You showed up in person at a show on the other coast. Yes. Oh, because you're a dreamboat. I just really think that you are one of the best storytellers I've ever seen. And I, you know, I trained as an actress. I went to theater school. I just, uh, I think you're the bee's knees. I really why, do. Why am I one of the best storytellers you've ever seen? Like, what's what makes the best? I'm not so fishing I, for comp. I kind of am fishing for compliments. <laughs> but what makes what makes the best to you? Because that's such a personal decision. Absolutely. Best. So, personally, I'm charmed by you. I'm charmed by the the way that you speak, the way that you craft your pauses, <laughs> the syntax of the way that you that you put your sentences together. I just find you incredibly engaging. I want to root for you in in all your stories. And the fact that you are just brassy and explicit is so delightful <laughs> to me. Brassy and explicit. Yes. I'm going to put that on my podcast. Brassy, brassy and explicit. And explicit. <laughs> this body story time. I have been called brassy a <laughs> few hundred times in my life, but I like those two words together even more. Yes. And I think that there is... At core, I a heart, a really warm, compassionate heart that I feel from you that is important to me in, the, in my storytellers. Like, I don't really like mean humor. I like humor that is yeah, funny exactly. because it's true. Yeah, I have a very hard time finding the right stories for the stage because so many people are just like... <laughs> for example, I went to L.A. a while back and I posted in a group and said looking for stories of sex positivity, sex kink and gender. And somebody responded and said, I want to tell a story about the ugliest hooker I ever fucked and how she shit all over my bed. (gasps) And I went, that story is not sex positive. They went, what are you talking about? It's totally sick. I'm like, no, you're positive you had sex. (laughs) But that story was not sex positive. They're like, huh, I don't get it. A lot of people don't know what sex positive means. I know. Well, and and also it's just not a nice term, right? It sounds like Mm-mm. HIV positive. Like do, it doesn't I sound know. good. I know. And people who are not us, muggles always think it means HIV positive. I know. We really need a better term. We do. And I used to work for um, a lot of adult dating and kink and gender related websites. And we looked for the right word professionally for yeah. years. And nobody's ever come up with the right word yet. So send us your ideas if you have any. Yeah. But it's... But you inspired me because I had been searching and through many early episodes, I'd talked with several people about the word slut, which I still don't like. I just Mm -hmm. don't like the word itself. Mm -hmm. The the way that it's the slut, you know, it just doesn't sound (laughs) good to me. And so all across the way, I don't listen to music. And as I've been driving, I've been listening to books on tape and podcasts. And I listen to a ton of body. And you had an episode that was themed libertine. And I was like, that is it. That is the word I want to use instead of slut. Libertine. Because to me, it sounds like the freedom and the sensuality. Whereas slut just still sounds like a slur to me. And I just don't want to, I just don't want it. You know, the word body is a very old fashioned word. And a lot of Mm -hmm. people who are under 35 don't know the word. Libertine is even more so. (laughs) Even older. Yes. I love it. Maybe we can get um, a recording of Jefferson Berge's Libertine song for your podcast (gasps) so that you can 
have your anthem on there. Oh, that would be delightful. Yeah, he wrote, that's probably my favorite song he's written. He's written a lot of songs for me, and that's my current favorite. I'm just like, do Libertine again. Yes. I want to see him Monday night perform somewhere, and he's performing all the songs he's written for Body. I'm like, do the Libertine, because I love yes, that song. Yes, it's so good. So suck a dick, lick a tit, little circles round a clit. Give me all you got, I'm a Libertine. Shove it in, take it out, what is all the fuss about? Give me all you got, I'm a Libertine. Yeah, so I've been on the road, Dixie, for a month. Mm -hmm. Almost exactly a month. I left on October 1st. And it has already been quite an epic adventure for me. I went solo. So I'm... Nobody has basically been in the car with me. That's great. It's perfect for your podcast. It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. And also just for my sense of... So I went cross country nine years ago. Mm -hmm. And I went across with my former best friend. Mm -hmm. And I came back on my own. Mm -hmm. And going across with her... Holy shit, that's a story. (laughs) It is, it is. It's actually uh, episode 10. It's a a quickie uh, that encompasses that friend death is what I is what I called it yeah yeah so <laughs> so this time I knew I wanted to be solo and and I wanted to also leave I have a little tiny bit more money than I did last time and so that allows me to not I did workshops all the way across last time acro yoga workshops and that meant that I needed to get up and go in order to fulfill my commitments in order yeah. to be able to have the gas money to continue. Yeah. And that meant that I might meet somebody, but sorry, I got to go, you know, or, <laughs> or somebody could invite me to something or say, oh, you should go there. And I just wouldn't have the space for it. Yeah. And this time I wanted that opportunity to sink into serendipity and, and allow synchronicitous things to happen. And if somebody pointed at me and said, you must go to the Garden of a Thousand Buddhas, I did, you yeah. know, because yeah. because I have that that space and that freedom, and I'm not catering to anybody else's desires, schedules, timing, temperature. Yeah. <laughs> the temperature is really a, a key one for me too. <laughs> That's the robes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always cold. So. <laughs> yeah. So. It's been gorgeous. I've visited with a lot of people who I hadn't seen in a long, long time some of whom have children now, like they have entirely different lives. One of my dearest friends from high school I saw and recorded with in Bangor, Maine, where he's living and working as an osteopath. And I saw someone who I hadn't seen since summer camp in the summer of 1995. (laughs) And he was having his wedding party and I got to see him and his wife. And then I... (laughs) And I'm I, jealous as fuck right now. Yeah. God. You could do. I would love to just, you know, I mean, I, that's the thing. I hate it when you get on, you're like, oh, I have to catch a plane. And that's a super stressful situation. Endeavor. And it's so comfortable to just travel in your car and put whatever you want on and not have a screaming baby. <sighs> and Because why is there always a screaming baby next to me on a plane? Uh, I'm I sorry. think they know I'm not the biggest <laughs> baby person in the world. They're like, let's put a baby on her. Yeah, yeah. Dogs come to me for that reason. I yeah. Think. Are you yeah. not a dog person? Oh, no. no. Really? Oh, I have a yeah. 160 pound St. Bernard. Whoa. Good thing we didn't do it at my house. <laughs> I mean, I can deal. I can deal, but. Yeah. Well, if you can deal with dogs, this is like a sea monster bred with a dog. Oh. So it's like you better be on board for a St. Bernard. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I see. I'm on board. You are not on board. I'm so it's good that board. we didn't do that. <laughs> So we're doing it in this little lovely, sweet little guest room at uh, this intentional community where I'm visiting a college friend that I went to theater school with. She lives here. So I'm super lucky to have this place to land for several days. How did you figure out where you're going to stay as you go cross country? So uh, I've had a lot of help from Facebook. (laughs) Facebook rocks for that. Oh my God. (laughs) I, I had several things kind of scoped out where I said, I know I'm going to come around this time. Is it okay? I don't know exactly the day yet. Is that okay with you? And people have mostly been really flexible and really lovely. And so I set up kind of the first nine days of the trip and I knew where I was going to be. Mm -hmm. And then as I started going across, I didn't have as many people going across. And so Mm -hmm. I would put out some calls on Facebook saying, know anybody in between 
this spot and this spot. <laughs> so no one, know anybody four hours from this place? Because I was trying to do no more than four or five hours legs of driving. Mm -hmm. Because more than that really gets intense. And I did more than that a, a few days. But not much more. Whereas the last time I did seven, eight, nine hour drives and that was just unhealthy. <laughs> no good. <laughs> but well, I'm was, jealous. I was telling somebody about the, uh, about the adventure and I was just in Portland and I reconnected with an old lover, which was really beautiful because I actually hadn't had a penis inside me since I parted from my ex. How long ago was that? Five months ago. And we were monogamous for close to a year. So I hadn't been with anybody else been, in a year and a half. Yeah. I, and nobody I'm else. I'm good had at been math. Inside. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to dick, I'm pretty good at math. <laughs> and it was beautiful because I'm kind of learning. I'm, I'm a little bit demisexual. And so I have this loving relationship. Mm -hmm. with him that was a little bit fractured because I got very, very angry <laughs> with what, what happened between us. But uh, that really healed it. Oh, that's great. And then I was able to mend a broken friendship that was related to that sort of love triangle kind of story as well. And so it feels really nourishing to be on this trip. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like it. And then I fired up Tinder, too, to see what I could <laughs> make happen. But nothing has happened in that in that regard yet. <laughs> you know what happens, Dixie? What? Uh, the few ones that I am into and that I match with, we start up a conversation. Usually they drop the ball. Oh, of course they do. Uh, That's what Tinder's for. Uh, for them to drop the ball. Why? Because we can turn people into commodities. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of like, do I really want chow mein right now? <laughs> <laughs> if you have an emotional bond with somebody, if you're connected, then you're like, Lila, I like Lila. Yes. But if it's just like... Pretty redhead. Yeah, redhead, redhead, redhead. <laughs> Which flavor of redhead do I want? <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, a menu. Yeah. It's kind of hard to be, I mean, sometimes you have a favorite restaurant, but you kind of have to have eaten there to have it be your favorite. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so deep. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually connected with somebody here. who I'm, In this community? Yes, mm -hmm. who I'm wildly attracted to and I think I'm kind of intimated that it just doesn't happen that often for me, which is... Dixie, it's very difficult because I have this really strong libido and desire to be touched. And then there's very few people that I really want to touch me. And then even fewer who are available to touch me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. So I'm, I still have not figured out how to sort of mm, ride this line. Have you thought about maybe a note that says, I love you. Do you love me? Check the box. Or you can make the dirty version of that, you know. <laughs> I want to boff you. Do you want to boff me? Check the box. Yes. No. Maybe. And I, they probably have a mailbox here in this community. You oh, can no, just no, drop it in the mail. We've already connected. Oh, you've got it. You don't need the note oh, anymore. Oh, no, no. I don't need the note. Okay. You sounded like you were trying to figure out how to get it across. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, that that I'm, I'm pretty good with. It's mm -hmm. more like finding them. <laughs> finding the ones that I'm attracted to. Yeah. <laughs> but I will. I will. Let them know, Dixie. <laughs> I will let them know. I've always been a big time flirt. Have so you, you know, so you know, my thing is I really love to connect people. So I got really into the. I thought you hadn't been able to connect with them, and I was like, Oh, oh, oh you know, this is what I like, do. I right? can do this. Yeah. Oh my god, that's my superpower. I can connect anything you want, pretty much. I was telling people about playing bango mm -hmm. at the show at the risk body storytelling show at the bell house in brooklyn and how you know there's the are you do you have an account on fet life and have you had sex outdoors and then do you want to hook up tonight yeah <laughs> and i noticed you didn't put the with me in no there. no no pressure <laughs> that's a lot of pressure <laughs> I mean, we're going to open the door, but we're not going to, like, shut you out in the cold and go, there you go. You better agree to fuck them. <laughs> there is, I'm not sure if I put one, because I was trying to make sure that I was um, 
including lots of stuff for Kevin on the cards. But usually there's... Oh, yeah. Because, you know, Kevin is uh, a big fucking deal, and I want to make sure that anybody I do a collaboration with feels super taken care of, too. So I was like, Kevin, pick things that you want asked about, ba- you know, about on you know, on the Bango card and stuff like that, which may have bumped one that we usually have on Bango, which is write in your own question. No, no, we had write in your own question. So write in your own question can be used for, um, let's say there is this beautiful redhead named Lila that you see across the room <laughs> and you're trying to figure out how do I break the ice with that person? You just go, um, you know, write in is a bottle redhead or, you know, anything you want that particularly relates to that person. Then you walk up to that person and go, are there any that you could write in or could you write your name in this one? (laughs) And then they're like, oh yeah, you get their name, you break the ice and it's definitely a party starter. Oh, you're so good at that. I love (laughs) that you're this, this, I don't know, you're like a mega connector. You're not just a connector. You're like a super connector. (laughs) Like when, like the old computers that used to take up a room, like you're that kind of connector. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, that's what I did in when I was a host of sex parties. I don't understand why you would leave your house and go to an event if you're, I mean, we're all dealing with social anxiety Oh my days. God, yes. So you better know you're going to get something out of it. And who wants to go to a place where everybody just walks up to you and goes, would you like to fuck? Because <laughs> that's no. off-putting. No. So, you know, if you came in and you had decent manners, my favorite thing to do was I was always the front door person yeah because I was very good at shooing you away if you weren't supposed to be at that party Mm -hmm. because I'm kind of ballsy and if you came up to me this happened almost every party somebody would come up and say this is my first sex party ever and I'm here visiting from Connecticut and I go that's awesome welcome and then I'd go find you when my shift was over and I would say okay Connecticut what you here for and they go, uh, what? And I'm like, it ain't about me. It's about you. What are you here for? And they go, I've always wanted to kiss a girl. I'm like, which girl? Yeah. And they go, that girl's pretty. I'm like, I know that girl. Let's go talk to that girl. And ah. then, because, you know, <laughs> sex parties, they are safer. Bless now. you. We yeah. need somebody like that at our party, at the Hacienda party. Yeah. Yeah. It's Maybe good it has to, have... to be me. <laughs> you know what? All those orgasms come back to you. Of course. They do. I mean, people associate all the good stuff that happened with you when you're the connector. (laughs) So they come back to you and they go, do you know Lila? Lila is awesome because look at all the shit you made happen. Body got me late. (laughs) Body got me late. I love it when people contact me after a show and go, okay, so here's what happened. And I'm like, awesome. I did that. That makes me feel so good when I know that people got the thing they wanted and that I helped. Storytelling does that better than anything I've ever seen. It's so easy to connect with people after you've heard a story. You know? Oh, yeah. Or they've told you your story. Mm-hmm. Are you falling asleep, Lala? Mm-mm. <laughs> I was just imagining just sort of doing that kind of matchmaking service. You know, like my role at the community where I live is the ambassadrix, as I like to call myself. <laughs> So <laughs> that would be well within my. What you know, does like, an ambassadrix do? Ambassadrix. Ambassadrix. Yeah, you got to warm your mouth up for that one. Ambassadrix. So I do the the PR things. You know, I talk to the press people, and then I usually introduce our events, and I lead icebreaker games. Mm-hmm. And this should just be on the list of things that I. You've inspired me. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can make it some sort of, not really a competition, but just kind of like rather than employee of the month, you get, you know, ambassador of the month or something like that. If you caused the most wishes to come true. Yes. Or the most hookups to happen or whatever your equivalent of that would be. That is a great idea. They get to be on the wall. They get to choose the picture that's on the wall. And it's like, I'm ambassador of the month. I made the most wishes come true. Because... Who didn't want more of that in the world? Absolutely. Kenneth and I have a little game where anytime I get him laid, he gets me a robe. And anytime he gets me and laid. And you said you had five robes on this trip? And no, how no, many robes no, no, do you no. own? <laughs> well, he, you know, he has, I'm picky, right? So he has a hard, he has a harder time. Mm-hmm. Anytime 
He uh, facilitates you getting laid? If it's the other way around, which way is yes, it? Yes, right. He facilitates me getting laid. I get him a bunny because his nickname mm-hmm. is Bunny. So I, I've gotten him a bunny bow tie. I've gotten him a little bunny magnet. <laughs> <laughs> and it depends on, you know, the quality of the lay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so did the, I'm sorry. The that's gift, the gift the shop gift. from Fisherman's <laughs> Wharf. That was a $3 lay right there. <laughs> Here's an FAO Schwartz bunny. Because right. that was Because that one was the cream of the cream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So have you done this from a very young age? Have you flirted and connected people? Were you a social kid? Well, I've always been a storyteller. I grew up in the South and spent summers in West Virginia. And when they do like a pig roast and they put the pig in the ground and they'd say, okay, now like three days, it'll be ready to eat. We would just kind of sit around and people play musical instruments and they tell stories. And I always kind of ignored the kids and sat and listened to the grown up stories. Mm. Um, and believe me, they weren't as interesting as the stories you hear at body, but you know, they did like to go back to how so-and-so rolled it down the mountain because they were drunk. They rolled their car, you know, shit like that. I was like, that's a good story. How long have I been? Yeah, I've always kind of been a connector. I was always, when I moved to Virginia in like the fourth grade, the first thing I would do is I was always the kid that would come up to you in school and go, hey, you're new, you know, let me show you around. Let me introduce you to people. And that's something that feels good to me. So I do that at parties. I do that at sex parties. You're new. Let's show you around. You oh. might want to fuck them. <laughs> it's a beautiful service that you do. It's <laughs> gorgeous. What did little Dixie learn about sex? Little Dixie. Oh, my God. Yeah. I was the one that informed everybody that babies did not come out your belly button. <laughs> <laughs> but who told you? I'm trying to remember that. I'm not sure how I found out, but I was I was the kind of kid that porn seemed to be a magnet for. Like, if it was left in the woods, I would be the one to stumble across it. <laughs> so I was always finding porn. Porn was a magnet for you. Yeah, I would just like, oh, look, gay porn, cool. And uh, so I can remember probably fourth or fifth grade, the girls saying that babies come out your belly button. And I say, no, they don't. They come out your hoo-ha. And they go, <laughs> right. I'm like, how do you think a human being could come out your belly button? They're like, how do you think a human being could come out your hoo-ha? <laughs> That's not possible. And I'm like, you got a point. <laughs> My mom told me the facts of life when I was, I think, 10 or 12, something like that. And she was so freaked out about it. That she sent me down with a book on everything you need to know about sex and just read the scary part. You know, there's sperm and an egg. Uh, if anybody kisses you, you're probably going to get pregnant. Oh That's pretty God. much what it sounded like to oh me. And she was so freaked out talking about sex that I had to stop her in the middle, go down the hall and throw up. Because she stressed me out so bad. Whoa. Because she was freaked out like, oh my God, I got to teach my daughter about sex. And I pretty much was like, what the fuck was that? I couldn't really understand why she was so freaked out. And then after a little while, I went, you know what? I'm pretty sure that there must be something great there if she's so sure she didn't want me. You know, it's kind of like they try and hide all the good stuff from you. So I'm like, she must have been hiding the good stuff from me. So um, about the time I was 15, I would go to work during the summer with her because we lived off in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And I would say, I'm going to go up to the movie house and just sit in the movies in the air conditioner all day. And then I would sneak around a corner, get on the bus, go across town to the porno theaters. And I would go in and I just wanted to learn about sex. And my mother had refused to sign the sex ed permission slip. Oh, Everybody thought that was funny because I was the sex ed program at my school. <laughs> the cheerleaders would say, how do you give a blowjob? I'd go, it's surprising. You don't actually blow. You suck. You know, and they go, how do you know that? I'm like, I have this gift to find porn, I guess. <laughs> uh, people badmouth porn. I'm like, I learned everything I know back when I wasn't allowed to have sex ed from porn. A lot of people do. 
So I would sneak across town to what they call the quarter loops. And the quarter loops are, if you watch the show The Deuce that's on HBO right now, they're kind of inventing the quarter loops on that show right now, which is if you want to watch porn, you put a quarter in, it shows you two minutes of a porno, and then the little screen goes down, and then you put another quarter in, you can watch the next two minutes of the porno. And I would go in, and I'd have my roll of quarters, which was my allowance, and I would go in, and none of the doors would actually lock. It was a pretty scary place. Oh my God, yeah. And uh, the doors wouldn't lock, and there were glory holes everywhere. And I would go in, and I'd learn how to give a blowjob, you know? Okay, I've always wondered about the glory hole situation. I mean, wouldn't a cock get, you know, splinters? <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> I thought the same thing the first time I saw one. I'm like, oh, you better be careful with that. Yeah, <laughs> Can I tell you a glory hole story? Yeah, of course. So my uh, best friend slash first boyfriend was gay. And um, he'd had more sexual experience than I had. And I loved porno theaters now. So we're probably, I don't know, 17, something like that. And because we have the ability to drive at that point, we went to the porno theater together. We'd gotten really stoned before we went in. And we're in there. And those things, those little tiny theater things are designed for one person to sit on the bench, you know. And what happens is there's a film projector. The projector is behind your head above you. And it projects onto the door that you just closed. And there's 15 or 20 little tiny one seat wide enough so that two people aren't in there fucking. They think that's important. And I'm like, that's kind of the goal, isn't it? Right. And um, so my boyfriend Brian and I are squished into this tiny little booth together. And uh, got my purse on my lap. We're watching the movie. We're kind of stoned. And uh, all of a sudden my purse starts bouncing in my lap. And I'm just like, Looking down at it like, what the fuck's, what the fuck's that? <laughs> and uh, I'm like, Brian, what is that? And he's just like, uh, oh, it's a penis or something. He's talking about the movie. And I'm like, uh, okay. And I'm watching my purse dance in my lap. <laughs> so I move my purse out of the way. And I see this hand reaching through the hole. And it's coming through really slow. It's just kind of like dancing through. And it's just kind of like in the air. And I'm high. <laughs> so I'm just like, that's beautiful, huh? That's great. And it starts moving. And I, I'm not watching the movie. I'm just watching the hand. And all of a sudden, it just goes, bam, and grabs hold of my crotch. Don't know how he saw my crotch. Because I guess they could see through from the index booth. But the hole was big enough for a hand to come through. It grabbed me. I screamed. Oh my God. Jumped up. All of a sudden, the porn was playing on my face. Because I'm just like... <laughs> In for or trying to get away from the hand, which means I'm now in the line of projection. Brian Stone, he's just laughing his ass off. Like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, <laughs> and the hand's just like looking more, more. Oh and he's God. like, ah. We went, and of course, I'm the only female in the adult bookstore. So we're fighting to get out, but I'm blocking the door because it's so tiny. We can't get out. So we're scrambling, <laughs> hitting the walls. <laughs> Everybody comes out into the hall to hear what woman screamed. And we're just trying to push the door open. We're like falling out into the hallway. And uh, went running out to our cars having a panic attack. And that was my first experience with the glory hall. Wow. No, I hope you got splinters because that was scary. The hand coming. Oh my God. <laughs> it is terrifying. It's like a horror movie. Uh. So... I wanted to know a little bit more about, about Dixie's beginnings and what you saw of relationships growing up, what you learned about relationships from your parents. You like to talk about childhood a lot, don't you? I like to start there. Um, my dad ran off with another woman right about the time I turned two. So I didn't have a lot of exposure to it. My mom followed him to D.C. to try and get him back where he had was now living with the other woman. And so a lot of my childhood was spent, you know, her trying to get the father of her children back. There were two of us. Um, the second one was born right about the time he left. And so I'm not 
really sure what that says about me, but um, I think we finally gave up about the time I was 10 and we moved to Virginia. I don't know. I don't have that role model of parents who are together happily ever after kind of stuff. I'm very happy in my relationship right now, but I was pretty sure when I was, I've been pretty sure my whole life that I was never going to have love. So I figured if I wasn't going to get love, I was going to get a good story. Hmm. So a lot of the stories that you've heard that I've told have been about me going, okay, well, if we get what I want, the thing that I want is a great story. So I love to craft personal ads and just make up ridiculous scenarios so that I could get, you know, I figured it's an adventure. Sex is an adventure. So why not create an adventure with somebody? It's a little meta to create it like that, but it was always funny to see where it went. Well, what made you decide that you weren't going to have love? Because I got to see that there is no happily ever after, you mm -hmm. know? I just got to see pining. I didn't get to see true love expressed. So I figured that I was going to get it either. And if I wasn't going to get it, then what did I really care about? At first, it probably started with the thought that I'm going to have the sort of life when I'm, I don't know, imaginary number would be 75 or something. My memoir is going to be amazing. Yeah. You know, so you start thinking about what am I going to do to make it amazing? Pretty mm -hmm. much the ground rule is every time you have an extraordinary opportunity, you don't go home. You go do it mm -hmm. and you have to follow it through to the end. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure I did a lot of stupid things and people would go, you did what by yourself? Why would you go there by yourself? And I'm like, because <laughs> you don't sit and wait for people to go with you. It's just not going to happen. You pretty much better go make your adventure happen. And Right. And you're saying you don't wait for the story. You make the story. I make the story. Yeah, exactly. For the longest time I did, I had this one that I never got to have happen. But I had so much fun with it. Which was, I wrote a personal ad called The Unknown Hookup. And I said, I am going to meet you in a bar and you are going to show up with a brown paper bag with eye holes cut out and a mouth hole cut out. <laughs> You'll know who I am because I'll be sitting at the bar with a brown paper bag on my head with the eye holes and mouth holes cut out. And we'll sit there and we'll have a drink and we'll decide if we want to take it further. And if we want to take it further, we'll go back to my house, which is about a block away, and we will fuck with the bags on our head. And you'll have to wear a little brown paper bag on your fella too. <laughs> preferably a condom because that works better than a brown paper bag yeah. <laughs> that killed me just the thought of two people trying to fuck with bags on their head the rustling sound just killed me <laughs> and it was actually surprising how many people took pictures of themselves mostly nude with brown paper bags on their head it was really exciting to go wow you tried but none of them would meet me because they felt like they would look ridiculous sitting at a bar with a bag on their head. Mm -hmm. What if I stood them up? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to stand you up if you do that. I will be there. <laughs> but I had probably a hundred, at least a hundred responses from men and women going, if you threw this as a party, I would be there. Because they knew they wouldn't be the only one with a, pet, with a bag on their mm -hmm. head. So you might want to try that. Since you're an ambassadrix. <laughs> the bag on the head thing. Yeah, the unknown hookup. Put a bag on your head. They can still see your body, but there's a pheromonal reaction. There's a reaction that's not about your facial attributes. I just thought it was kind of... Wow, that would be difficult for me. Ugh, I'm Why? So, I'm so into faces. Well, you know, that's... I have a friend who really wanted to throw this as a party with me because she was like, I am superficial and I care if they're attractive. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wouldn't you like to know if pheromonally you're attracted to them? Mm -hmm. Or maybe physically, physical attributes other than their face? Those are all factors. Mm -hmm. What if you extract the facial one out? It would be interesting what you'd learn about yourself. Ooh. 
Dixie. See, I'm scientific and shit. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I heard a story about how you got turned into a scientist. <laughs> A couple of times a year, I do a nerd show, and I love really geeky stories about sex. But it's really hard to coach them because I'm not a nerd. <laughs> I want to be a nerd, but I'm always like, okay, other nerds who are in this show, can y'all pull out the great details that I can't do because I'm just not that, that's not how my brain works. Mm -hmm. I can coach you when it comes to storytelling, but when it comes to deep, deep science, I am at a loss. That thing about the, the belief of not, that you weren't going to find love, it strikes me because I've carried a, a really strong, although I think that I've worked with it enough to lessen it in the past few years, sense of, of unworthiness mm -hmm. and have chosen unavailable men that proved that to me. Yeah. Right, so that I could keep proving to myself that I wasn't worthy of love, that I wasn't going to be the one who was chosen. Somebody else would be chosen over me. That, um, you know, for some reason I didn't get to have the partner that I dreamed of. Mm -hmm. And now I'm learning some other things. Like, I actually t seem to lose sexual attraction pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. and I don't take as many it's not chances it's that in terms of, of I guess probability if I'm not attracted to that many people and then there's only a few of them that are available to, to be engaged with me then the, the pool becomes smaller and smaller of people that I might be able to partner with hmm. you know hmm. And I've been kind of working with this sense of unworthiness and trying to cultivate self-loving acts even when I didn't feel that way. Yeah. So that I I sort of re reverse engineered some self-love. I think it started to to happen because I, I acted as if, almost like an acting exercise. Like yeah. what would what would a person who loves themselves do right now? Yeah. And I was telling them this morning as I was making breakfast in the communal kitchen and one of the guys who's from Germany said, do you like to cook? And I said, I like to eat. And if it means cooking for me to eat well, then I will, I will cook and I will enjoy it because it means I get to eat well. And he said, I will only cook nicely for other people. Mm -hmm. And I said, I used to be that way. And then I pushed myself to make breakfast as though I were making it for my lover, even though I was only making it for myself. Oh, that's great. So the breakfast I made this morning, I wound up sharing with other people, but I went into the kitchen to make it for myself and I would have made it just the same way. Like a full meal, you know, it was like a kale salad and sausage and, and egg sauteed with, with sunflower pate and you know <laughs> and, and um fried yam it was delicious so i had to do the performative acts and then it started to seep inward yeah i reward myself the day after a show i give myself what i call a stupid day I'm not allowed to think, hmm. not allowed to make any decisions. Probably best if I don't send any emails or sometimes I'll chat on the phone, but usually I don't have much voice the day after a show because I talk a lot during a show. Mm -hmm. But um, because I'm not very good at being good to myself, I'm always, if I'm home, I'm really good to my dog hmm. and my partner. Like I'll make him dinner or I'll take the dog and let him just go crazy, you know, and... When you're not good at being good to yourself, it's really nice to have somebody that is kind of right there. You know, sometimes other people are busy and you're like, but I really want to do something for somebody because we're always there when we need, you know, 
when we want to reward ourselves, that person is always available. The rest of the world isn't always available. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is to have a partner that you can go, I'm going to make you dinner and make it really pretty. Or take your dog to the dog wash and make him smell really good. And that way you get to snuggle them. So it's kind of like being nice to yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. So... Have you noticed in recording, how many of these things have you recorded by now? Let's see. Since you started being horizontal. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's somewhere in the realm of 25 or 28, something like that. Do you find that at this point in the show that people start to slow way down in their talking? You and I have slowed way down since we started. We mm-hmm. were stumbling over each other and now we're like, just kind of like, yeah, let's ruminate on that for a minute. It's yeah. much slower now. Yeah, but I love that mm-hmm. because this is the pace that feels really nourishing to me. Mm-hmm. And this is when I have my best non-recorded conversations with people. Mm-hmm. And these are the things that I find so precious that I wanted people to be able to eavesdrop on. Yeah. Because I know that not everyone has access to this kind of intimacy, and I think that is that is a pity. Hmm. Why your interest in intimacy? Hmm. I was a very lonely kid, and you were an only child. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I got into theater very young, and I think that was a desire to be to be witnessed at a time and in a way that I was willing to be witnessed right so I'm I am not an exhibitionist which I think is interesting hmm. because I'm that is a long time performer I would rather my play party personality is more of a voyeur and I like to hang back and observe and see who I want to engage with and then go and try to connect with that person and avoid everybody else. <laughs> That's a great distinction. Because I'm not an exhibitionist at all. And people think it's very funny that my I'm not a theater geek. I never was part of that world. My thing is totally grassroots. But for me, it's, it's not being on stage. That's not, I'm not even sure it's something I really enjoy after 11 years of doing it. But I love putting people on stage. Mm. I love... Having people not believe in themselves. And then you go, you know, your story is actually really interesting. Let me pull out the interesting parts with you. Mm-hmm. You know, you get to decide what you say. But I can tell you, I represent the audience. And that thing you said, I want to know more about that, which means they're probably going to want to know more about that. Because most people don't believe in themselves. They- Absolutely. As I was recording my pitch to you, I thought, you know, this really might not be body enough. Like, this isn't, the, the, people aren't going to think this is sexual napalm. This isn't, like, hot enough. I mean, it's hot to me, but, yeah. you know, and I was having that same kind of, of insecurity that you mentioned on the show where, you know, it's like, oh, my story's not enough enough. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see what my necklace is? Enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somebody just gave it to me, and I'm like, I think that's something we can all really relate to. Oh, my God. We never... We either feel like we're too much socially mm-hmm. or we're not enough on a personal level intimately. Why would anybody be with us when there are so many options? Why would my story be worth it when there are so many people to choose from? Mm-hmm. We always want to tell ourselves we're not good enough. You know? But for every story out there, there's somebody who relates to it. And I have that similar experience, right? And And particularly I have it surrounding when I became bold enough to share about my insecurities Mm -hmm. and fears and traumas yeah and I found that when I when I was people responded oh yeah and people told me stories in return yeah and people felt connected to me in a way that they hadn't before and told me oh I really thought you were this I felt intimidated by you. I thought you were a stuck-up pretty person or whatever it was. However they had perceived me, suddenly they actually saw me. Yeah. And that, to me, that is, that's, 
is what it's about. That's that's why I'm here. That's what it's about. That's yeah. what it's for. Life. That's why you know. That's why I have a human form like that. That is, it's intrinsic to me. This desire for intimacy and to cultivate intimacy between myself and others, and then between others. Yeah, a lot of people pitch me these crazy over the top stories. They're so wild. And they go, there you go. That's perfect for your show. And I'm like, what's relatable about that? Hmm. The whole reason we love storytelling is that we can put ourselves in place of you and walk through your life, Hmm. you know? And maybe if you like listening to people who are ballsy and you're shy, that's one way that storytelling can serve a purpose. But it's not aspirational. It's aspirational, but it's not going to be the kind of thing that resonates with you. Relatability is found through the vulnerability of admitting, I never thought I was good enough. I never thought I was, you know, it's the same thing with, I have to convince people all the time. Right before I came over here, I followed up with a storyteller who was like, my stories aren't really wild. And I'm like, mm-hmm. what makes you think they got to be wild? Yeah, wild stories definitely have a place on the stage. But the one that sticks with you, the one you're thinking about a month later, is the one where that person opened up and showed their flaws. That's where we all live. We know what it's like to be imperfect. Every single day we beat ourselves up about it. That's the story that you want. Like, we're all driven crazy by movies where they leave the end open-ended. And we want them to resolve it. But that's also the story that sticks with you. And you're still thinking about a week later going, Mm -hmm. oh my God, what if they did this? What if they did that? One of the kind of, I guess, forerunners for me in my life to this project, to this podcast was that for three years as I was yoga teaching, I really wanted to make it more of this intimate experience and so I would sit down once a week and think okay what is really going on what is actually going on with me what am I experiencing Mm -hmm. and and I would calibrate it so that it wasn't a one-woman show at the beginning of class but I would share just enough about something that was true about what I was experiencing to relate to a theme that might be meaningful to them And then I started gathering. So I would teach on this and I would speak on this in every class. So say 10 times that week, I would have a chance and I would, different things would come to me, different quotes, different stories, different scenarios, and I would jot them down. And at the end of the week, I would sit down and I would create a little, a little email and I would call it my missive. As though I had, you know, put this little thing in a bottle and, and you know, thrown it out to sea. Mm-hmm. And people started really responding. My, my yoga students started to write back to me. Each one, at least one person would write back to me and tell me story in return or say, I really need to hear this right now. Or thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's so uh, raw, you know. And then one week, I wrote about this unrequited heartbreak that I had where I really fell in love with a fantasy man and had it sort of ongoing for several years and every once in a while every couple years you know we would have an encounter and I would think well maybe now he's going to see you know how (laughs) and then the last time he had said do you want to go to Maine in my plane next weekend I was like oh my god (laughs) here are the people who made this episode possible Chad Michael Snavely has edited every episode in Season 2. Check out his roster of podcasts on chadmichael.com. Shauna Shea created my cover art, and you can hire her through 99designs. And Alan Markley wrote my intro music. He's Plastic Cannons on the Instagram. If you want more words and pretty pictures from me, sign up on horizontalwithlila.com. I'm also at Horizontal with Lila on Facebook Instagram, and Twitter.
drop by, ask me a question, make a suggestion for a future topic, or just say hey. Earlier in the episode, I played a clip from Jefferson Berge's song, Libertine. I'm campaigning for the word libertine to be used as a synonym for the word slut because I think it's so much lovelier. And in the spirit of effective campaigning, I present music. Libertine in its entirety. For the first time ever on Horizontal with Lila, a song. Take it away, Jefferson. I'm going to play a song channeling Elvis Costello called The Libertine. Am I doing it yet? Call me the libertine and I'll say, well, okay. Is it so bad? I like to feel good. I'm always standing at the sneeze guard at the body part buffet. Is it so bad that I like to feel good? Just like Dr. Frankenfurter told Janet and Brad. Is it so bad I like to feel good? Just give in to the pleasure and forget about mom and dad. Gross. Is it so bad I like to feel good? Suck a dick, lick a tit, little circles round a clit. Give me all you got, I'm a libertine. Shove it in, take it out, what is all the fuss about? Give me all you got, I'm a libertine. Hey, libertine. Oi, 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 oi. Hedonism, hedonism, yeah, you should. Is it so bad, I like to feel good? If no one's having sex with you, then I probably would. Is it so bad? I like to feel good. So suck a dick, lick a tit, little wiggles on the clear. Give me all you got, I'm a libertine. Shove it in, pull it out, what is all the fuss about? Give me all you got, I'm a libertine, libertine. You can call me depraved. You can call me on. You can do whatever will help you blow the biggest one. You will know me by the sound of oh my god. But you can call me the Liberté. Eyes wide shut, more like mouth open wide. Everyone's invited to come inside. No one's ever disappointed that they went. Cause I treat my body like a circus tent. (laughs) But I'm much nicer to the animals. I never fuck with the animals. One, two, three, four, suck a dick, little tick, little circles on the clit. Give me all you got, I'm a libertine. Shove it in, throw it out, what is all the fuss about? Give me all you got, I'm a libertine, libertine. You can call me depraved, call me odd. You can do whatever it takes to make you blow your wand. You can call me the Marquis de Bourne. It's a little on the nose, but you can call me the Liberté. You can call me the Liberté. You can call me the Liberté. 